On Valentine's Day, that is the 14th of February in 1989, the leader of Iran issued a fatwa against Salman Rushdie, a religious decree calling for his immediate death. The reason for this? For being blasphemous against Islam, and therefore ordering a bounty for the novelist's assassination. The BBC published the Ayatollah statement later that day. I inform the proud Muslim people of the world that the author of the Satanic Verses book, which is against Islam, the Prophet and the Quran, and all those involved in its publication who are aware of its contents, are sentenced to death. Scotland Yard, who had been working closely with Rushdie, had advised the 11,000 staff of Viking Publishing about the potential danger, and there were internal memos to increase the security of the distribution, depots, offices, and bookshops which held his book. This religious decree, this fatwa, sent Rushdie into Hiding, and the fatwa affected the lives of many surrounding the controversy of the satanic verses. Torre Caprioli, who was an Italian translator of the book, was seriously injured from a stabbing in Milan on the 3rd of July 1991. In the same year, Hitoshi Iragashi, who translated the book into Japanese, was stabbed to death on the 11th of July. William Nygaard, who helped publish the novel in Norway, was shot three times in an attempted assassination on the 11th of October 1993. Turkish translator Aziz Nesin, who was arguably the intended target on the 2nd of July 1993, led to the deaths of 37 people. In theory, a fatwa should last until the death of the person who issued it. However, despite Khomeini's death on the 3rd of June 1989, Rushdie was still receiving a little Valentine's Day card reminding him that Iran was not forgetting the vow to kill him. In 2016, the Iranian Fars news agency had announced that media outlets had pooled together funds to theoretically make available a reward for Rushdie's murder. And that figure was into the millions of dollars. Yes, we're going to talk about The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. A book whose legacy and infamy overshadows everything within this 500-page book. A book about immigration, a book about love, a book about death, a book about changing beliefs and changing statuses. A book that is overshadowed by a subplot. I think it's absurdly lazy when people only talk about section 2 Mahound, that of the chapter where the prophet Mahound receives the holy word by the archangel. And it turns out those words are not godly but satanic. In this copy, that section is only just over 30 pages. I don't think that should take precedence over what Rushdie is doing. And I want to talk about what Rushdie is doing, what the characters are doing, in order to explain what Rushdie has done and why he has done it. Now, I know some of you might not believe this, but I wasn't born yesterday. I'm not completely naive. This book is offensive to some people. There were book burnings. This book is still banned in some countries. You physically can't read the satanic verses. And I also am aware that not all Muslims would find this offensive. Therefore, if your disposition is that this is a wholly offensive book, that's fine. That's fine. You're entitled to that view. And I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I don't think Rushdie is here to convince you otherwise. Now, before we get into the plot of the characters, I want to talk about some, not misinformation, but some misunderstandings about the book. The first and most notable is that this book isn't focused on the Middle East, neither is it focused on Arabs. The two main characters, Gabriel Farishta, and Saladin Chamchawala are Indians. They're Indian Muslims. Secondly, Rushdie only became famous because of this infamous book, which is not true. Rushdie was an applauded and lauded author. This book was published 
years after Midnight's Children, one of the most important English language partition novels ever written. Do some more research online or read the book and then do your research, you'll be illuminated to the fact that many people talk about this book about scenes and of which never happen within the satanic verses. Now one question that comes up time and time again and is probably on your mind as you're watching this or has come up in your mind when people talk about the satanic verses is did no one foresee this being offensive? And in fact they did. Kushwan Singh who wrote the pivotal and seminal train to Pakistan was one of the advisors in Penguin India and he said reading this I don't think it's going to translate well outside of the audience that you think it is for and Penguin decided well let's see what happened. I don't think they foresaw the Ayatollah Khomeini issuing a fatwa and ended up killing people at all. The events that occurred after the publication of this book, and I don't think it matters what side of the aisle or what your opinion is on this, it's a blot in the history of literature. Many lives were impacted, many lives were lost. And if you want to understand Salman Rushdie's own view on this, I would look to his 2012 memoir, Joseph Anton, which is a third person narrative of Salman Rushdie under his alias, Joseph Anton while he was in hiding. I think it's very important to understand the whole Rushdie affair. Let's move the controversial topics aside. Let's talk about the start of this book. We're in the sky. A plane explodes due to a terrorist attack. Don't listen to people on the internet. It's actually not Muslim fundamentalists. If you have read the book, they're Sikhs. The bomb is accidentally detonated because they're too busy arguing about what they should actually do. Falling down from the sky entwined are Gibriel Farishta and Saladin Cham Chawala. And as they fall from the heavens, a metamorphosis takes place. Gibriel turns into the archangel Gabriel and Saladin turn into the devil. And within this, the angelic become demonic and the demonic become angels and there they hit the ground mostly unscathed in L-O-N, D-O-N, London. But how do we get to these two Indian men in an embrace up in the sky where a bomb is to be exploded? Well let's talk about their backstories. Now if you've read Rushdie you know he loves a character backstory. Sometimes he loves them a bit too much. Let's start off with Gabriel Farishta. Now Farishta is a celebrated Indian actor and the roles that he predominantly takes on are of deities. One day Farishta wakes up and realises that he has a mysterious illness that causes many problems, one of which are that he profoundly bleeds from his anus and his penis. But the nation of India are crowding around him. They are sending cards, they are sending their wishes, they are prayers, they are flowers, they want Farishta to get better. He's a national treasure. And as mysteriously as the illness comes, it mysteriously disappears. Not everything is left as it is found and Gibril loses his faith. Equally, another Indian Muslim who loses his faith is Saladin Chamchawala. Now, Saladin Chamchawala is a little bit of a mouthful to say. And throughout this, Rushdie calls him Spuno. So from here on out, Spuno. Spuno is also celebrated, but not in the same way. He doesn't really have the face of Gibriel. He isn't a national icon. Instead, Spuno has been given the name The Band of a Thousand Voices. He's a, he's a voiceover actor. Spudo, I would confidently say, is trying to move away from being Indian and he will use his voice in any way, shape or form that he can to not really fit the identity that he has. He doesn't feel as though Indians can even have a sense of shame, that within their culture, within their history, shame is not something that comes to the forefront of Indian literature. If you want an exploration of Rushdie's view on shame in regards to India and Pakistan, I would recommend his book, Would You Believe It? Shame. Spudo ends up falling out of love, falling out of faith and falling out with his 
family and sets off on a plane to go to London where he bumps into Gabriel. Up the plane goes and down it comes in a blast. Now Spuno ends up waking up on the shores with hooves and horns. He actually turns into the devil. Gabriel, on the other hand, is as angelic as it possibly comes, and he walks off into London to find his way. Spooner would like to do the same, but of course, walking around with cloven hooves and horns on your head does cause a little bit of suspicion. And there, he is taken in by the police, where an interrogation occurs, and he is ultimately brutally subjected to violence, where he is exploited. Rushdie, within this vile scene, expertly showcases the injustice that happens within the system and how the British people view outsiders as these demons that are needed to be exercised. Now, Spudo feels as though Gabriel will come in and vouch for him that he's come here legally and what has happened, but no one really believes him and Gabriel doesn't even turn up. Gabriel has turned his back on Spuno. Spuno realises that just as he has turned his back on his own people, Gabriel has turned his back on his own people. And Spuno feels even more angry and vows to disrupt the life of Gabriel. And the more resent, the more anger that he feels, the more human he becomes. Now, how is Spuno going to upturn Gabriel, the literal embodiment now of the Archangel Gabriel. Well, don't go for the jugular, go for the heart. Alleluia, come down from the sky or down from the mountain. Yes, the mountaineer Ali Cone. Gabriel is devoted and besotted to Ali. Now here, their relationship builds upon each other because Ali Cone realises that something's happened to Gabriel. He might view himself as the Archangel Gabriel, but in fact, he's schizophrenic. Welcome to the KD Books Art Hour. I know it's very impressive. But basically, let's think about Ali Cohn and the Mountain. Now, the Mountain, across literature, has been associated with a sublime closeness and relationship with the people up here. The heavens. Now, Salman Rushdie actually subverts this, which comes from the romantic legacy. So if you look at Manfred by Byron, Mont Blanc by Percy Shelley, this actually talks about more of a pantheistic view about the relationship between humans and nature and that sublime journey. With Ali Code, who sent up the mountain. Why are her eyes like that? <laughs> Sorry, Ali Cohn, but with her ascent, she doesn't get closer to heaven. If you think about, uh, this, is, this is a door, but by the way, if you think about Mahoud, where he's situated on the mountain, where the archangel Gabriel with wings comes to speak to him, let's think about that proxemic between the heavens and the people below. What does that all mean? This as a whole is a romantic legacy drawn from the Satanic School of Poetry. So if you want to look into this a little bit more, Satanic School of Poetry are the people to go to. I hope that people would ascend the mountain and obtain a religious experience. Ali Cohn ascends Mount Everest and when she gets there she has a secular experience through magic realism. Let's move into the segue of magic realism. Magic realism is not fantasy. Let's get this right, people. Fantasy is not magic realism. You know what? I'm just going to input my Midnight's Children clip here because I stand by it. Oh, Clegg, quick side note. Let's talk about the difference between fantasy and magic realism because I think it's very important to understand the difference and see how Salman Rushdie is actually going to play with that. Let's start off with fantasy because most people will understand what that is, which are fantastical elements such as magic, sorcery, but it's set in a world that's equally um, unfathomable and fantastical. Magic realism on the other side has elements such as magic sorcery but set in the mundane, it's set in the now. So it's something that you can actually believe 
again, very quick, the summary, but yeah. Now that we've tied that off in a nice little bow, let's talk about section two, Mahound, where Mahound is a reimagination of the prophet. And to say reimagination is quite apt because all of this happens within a dream sequence. Gabriel in his schizophrenic state feels as though he goes back in time to the town of Jalila. Now Jalila is a polytheistic town and Mahound encounters the archangel Gabriel and through wrestling, through understanding about submission, Gabriel vomits the word into Mahound's mouth. As Mahound now descends the mountain, he tells everyone the words of God, what he believes is the words of God. There will be a revelation that these were not indeed holy words. Later on in the story, one of the scribes who was writing this out, who actually has a very similar name to Salman Rushdie, that's a very Salman Rushdie thing, there's a little bit of self-insertion, realises that these words are not godly at all. But by that part in the story, Julila has converted to the words of the angel Gabriel, realising that these are not godly words but satanic, the damage is already done. Rushdie, I should note, but you should know by now, is clearly not religious and talks about how maybe people find comfort in these words. They find meaning in these words, not because they are true, but because they want to feel something. A lot of people say that about religion. That doesn't seem to be too controversial to be. How far will people go following the words of others to get what they ultimately want? And we talk about that in the religious aspect with, well, where this lovely butterfly comes from, with Aisha, who is told that her mother has breast cancer, but through a pilgrimage to Mecca, she will survive. Aisha obtains a following who embark on this pilgrimage with her, and it is hard, it is arduous. And this truly mirrors the exodus of Moses crossing the desert. Now, some people die, some people lose faith, some people turn back around, but some people hold on to that faith. Daisha knows what she is doing, and when she says that the sea will part for them, Rushdie, rather than being explicit in what happens, she gives us reports, gives us second-hand accounts counts and they completely contradict each other's. Some people see them cross safely, others see them drown. What does happen is up to you. Do you believe the accounts of Aisha? Do you believe this is an actual story or is it all a dream sequence? Is it all from the head of Gabriel? But if we look at what has happened in the story, people follow the words of Gabriel before he turned into the archangel, before people had a religious connotation to what Gabriel is saying. People followed him, people loved and cherished him in a secular manner, similar to Saladin Chamchawala, Spudo, the man of many voices. People listened to what he had to say. There was no religious connotation there, but people will follow blindly to what they feel is best in their interests. And what is best in your interests is only you to decide. Think about it. Life is a journey of decisions and we decide what information to listen to, what feels right, who we want to listen to. Now we can provide arguments, we can receive counter arguments, we can read accounts, we can look at reports, we can see well what has worked in the past. We can think well if it worked for this person surely it could work for me if I follow in the same steps. This isn't even about religion any moment. This could be any decision. People can give you warning, they can mention the red flags and you could decide to turn a blind eye or you could have a little bit of hindsight, you could have a little bit of ounce of self to look inwards and go, yeah maybe that isn't the best idea, maybe you'll want to tweak some things. We all have to make a decision and Rushdie is showcasing that maybe we're not as truly independent as we feel. Lastly, this book has a bleak ending, but I feel Rushdie 
leave space for hope. Hope that Gibriel and Spuno will realise that maybe they shouldn't interfere in other people's lives. Maybe they shouldn't be pushing their agenda, pushing their arguments, trying to sway people into their belief. Isn't it more comforting to know that we can all have different beliefs, different outtakes, different perceptions on the same topics, and rather than vying with each other that ultimately leads to violent ends, surely we should be able to respect each other, surely we should be able to understand. Rushdie for me showcases that it is better for us to have opposing viewpoints, differing outcomes and varied perspectives rather than vying over who is correct and what is true and what is right because ultimately you end up with violent ends. For me this is a 9 out of 10. Rushdie hits the mark on most things. It will make you think, it will make you uncomfortable but with that it'll make you sad, it'll bring a sense of melancholia. It will also have you feeling joy as you understand the hilarity of what Rushdie is doing as he subverts every expectation that you think a book should do. He turns everything on its head and if you have an opinion on this book before reading it, maybe, maybe you'll change your mind as well.